Hello, everyone. Our next how to of the day is with the wonderful Remy Boganel, the Chief Innovation Officer from Impact Hub. Remy is a holistic thinker and servant design leader and is going to explain to us how to build new business models that have regenerative effects. The focus is not just about growing economies, but also how to help and um, uh, help people and planet to thrive. Remy, over to you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. So, um, yes, indeed, my name is Remy. I'm French. Nobody's perfect. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to get through a presentation where I will focus essentially on um, mental models and beliefs and fears that are blocking uh, all our efforts to be successful. So, um, I shall start with that slide. Um, originally from Bill Reed, uh, an architect that does uh, regenerative architecture for more than 20 years now, who sort of uh, express in very simple terms that the economy is on the left-hand side now, pretty much extractive, um, with many mindsets that are linked to re reductionist, uh, that the economy and, and the company are operating like a machine. Uh, it's very much about efficiency. Um, it's about quantitative growth, uh, siloed problem uh, with a mindset of scarcity, competition, uh, shareholder value, uh, modeling, planning, et cetera. And we know, and that's pretty why we hear that it's not going well. So he's explaining basically that to move the other way, it's a proper paradigm shift where we move closer to um, system view of life. Like how does, uh, biology work and what is a living system really and how could that inspire the way we operate within a group, within a company, within communities and within uh, the entire economy. That's the main objective of, of my presentation today. So he presents um, six paradigms. The very first uh, being the, the conventional business, right? And conventional design, it's business as usual business of business is business, the point is to make money and externalities are not for the company to deal with. This is for NGOs, companies or citizens. And so this is where we design stuff, product and the market grow through material uh, uh, volumes. Then later came the second paradigm, which is about uh, green efficiency. So we still make stuff, but we try to making, make them a little bit more efficient. It is better, but the problem, it never really works because the more product is efficient, the more we make use of it. So that creates what we call this bouncing effect. The third paradigm is about sustainable design where we try to get neutral, promote services and usage, uh, economics of functionality, uh, circularity, refactoring, which has a huge impact on the way we designed and it is much better yet all these three paradigms are all about reducing uh, externalities and not yet much about doing good. Bill Reed claims to go positive and on the right hand side, we have to link the economy to a purpose. Before it's an economics of means. So I make stuff and uh, with the GDP, for example, the simple case, which is that shows how absurd it is. If I drive a car, to work and I kill someone on the road, from an economic point of view, I create value because the value is agnostic of uh, the benefit for society. I'm just creating wealth. Going on the right hand side implies being thoughtful on what is it we want to do. And so first is restorative design. So we do things to people or nature. It's the impact driven business we're talking about. So it's about mutuality. We cooperate and eventually the business model is linked to the the performance, you know, Golden Brown invented that in the UK in the early 2000s, where he say, I'm going to get young kids uh, from uh, unprivileged areas to high education. I'm going to put 30% of a big sum to kickstart the project, and the rest will only come out of performance. If 50% of the girls succeed to go to higher education, you get this, 60% that, etc. That's the foundation of impact economy. This is good uh, and it improves because the performance is all about getting money if you do good. Then the next one is about being reintegrated in, in nature, um, integrated systems. And the last one is very much about partnering. 
and uh, doing as nature as much as possible. There's a business model aligned to each of them. The very first is growth driven, then efficiency driven, then service driven business model, then impact driven, then integrating approach to flourish. It's not about growth, it's about having a good life. And the last one is about uh, enabling emergence of life. So um, in a sense, the three big concepts to keep in mind are like on the left, it's very much about ego driven uh, paradigm. Like in most uh, big myths, we are above nature. Nature is a resource for us to consume. The second echo puts us right back in the ecosystem that we depend on. And Seva, the last one, is about being at the service of life because without life, we, we there is no economy. So serving life first is a condition for the economy to operate. There are different compass to help that, some of which you might be familiar with. Of course, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are pretty much on doing less bad. Um, did not donut. You're probably very familiar is defining a social foundation and planetary boundaries. So it, it it's a model that qualify certain topics to keep an eye on. So it's very prescriptive. And the last one for regenerative economy, it's about generative principles. It doesn't say what to do. It gives a way of thinking. Now, if you map that in space, there is, um, I, I try to simplify by saying, okay, so people think uh, regenerative economy is, is all about biomimicry and, and this kind of stuff. Not quite to me. Indeed, it could cover material, but on horizontal axis, that model I made, it's like, Yes, it's about matter and product, but beyond to, to get towards regional economics, it's much more about getting towards service than ecosystem and ultimately bioregions. Then on the vertical axis, uh, it's the Einstein ladder of citizenship. So it's it goes beyond being a consumer or a prosumer. It's about being actor. Everyone in an ecosystem has a right to vote, to decide, and be engaged in the transformation. And I show you how with digital technology. So regenerative economy is not just about biology. It's it's applying biology as a system dynamics that include uh, society. And so for Fridge of Kappa, the four foundations of living systems are, they are in open network. They are, by definition, regenerative. So they can heal themselves, living system can be repaired, they repair themselves and, and, and they have a way to maintain life. They are creative in the way they approach problems and their intelligence in the sense they're exchanging information with their environment. This is good, but then another scientist, Labori, says to change a system, you need, um, it, it doesn't happen uh, just in the thermodynamics thing. It's not just energy and matter. It actually at another level, it's at the level of information. If information structure and flow change, then everything change. That means if you change a language, a business language, if you change accounting language, if you share the language, uh, what it means to live together, elements of this information structure and flow is the way to transform things. And a living system has certain dynamics. It's like a game in a way, like a living game where things are interconnected nested, they are emergent properties, their self-organization, it's non-linear, it's context sensitive and they are tipping points. It's completely differently, it's completely different from the way we think the economy today. So now the question is, so we know that, we know that for many years, what stop us from switching from this uh, extractive paradigm to this regenerative paradigm? This is the point of my presentation. My assumption is, the proposal for here for conversation is from the um, spire dynamics of Claire Grave, who studied what is it to be uh, morally mature. He modeled uh, eight ways of seeing the world from surviving to kinship, safety and security to willpower and action and passion to stability, order and morality to self-expression, success driven and rationality to community sensitivity and harmony, to integral system thinking and then holistic. 
So there are worldviews that qualify each level. There are objectives, values, social structure, the way groups organize, relationships to time and fears. How good, how, how, how interesting that is, because when you look at worldviews, I just pick up a few. So the, the, the purple um, is like a tribal, it's about fusion, it's animistics, time is uh, cyclical, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the blue, um, <clears throat> Uh, sorry, in red, uh, worldview is it's all about war and power, and the world is in a, is a jungle, and nature nature is to be conquered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, orange is um, it's about modernity, uh, reflexivity, science, progress, mar progress, market, resource, and opportunities for prosperous life. Most of the economy is in orange, between blue and orange. Uh, this could we could call modernity, but then comes postmodernity in green, and then system and holistic. The point of this, so if you if you think of how could how could that apply to changing the economy to be sustainable? In a way, you could think of the red being about activists, blue being about the space for the norm, uh, orange being the space for efficiency, circularity, green being about striving together, mutuality, cooperation, and yellow about impact and blue about regeneration. Now, how does it go about fears? Then we get at the core of what might be stopping us from progressing. If you say in red, so most of the world population lives within the pattern red and blue, and um, what we call developed countries are between orange, uh, blue, orange, and green, and most advanced like in the Nordics, uh, are, uh, between green and yellow. So there are fears at each, each level. So for instance, in red, it's fear of loss or uh, humiliation or betrayal. It's like a winner loser. Um, blue, it's about order and morality, it's black and white, uh, right and wrong. While, uh, in orange, it's about uh, it's success and achievement, et cetera, et cetera. All fears are actually driving a way of seeing the world. And the problem is, uh, until you go to yellow from the second cycle, when you have your own fears, you hate the levels above and below. So when you're orange, you hate the people in green and you hate the people in blue. So that has a lot of consequence. Does that mean, uh, do we all have to go at the very top? Potentially. Um, and I'll get into the detail. Now, situation is, um, when you look at uh, what are the levers of transformation and in terms of effort and effect, uh, Brooklyn and Alwood in, in 2012 made a proposal and classified 13 options. We believe as designers often that the new narrative and new storytelling is important, but when you look at it, uh, a narrative is only number 12. The first is influence social norm, and it comes from experience and experience before storytelling. So when you classify that, then comes the question, so what it means to influence the social norms. So uh, if you if I map all these levers, they, they, they can you can see them all mapped on the spiral dynamics. So like you get back to having performance, uh, certain goals in orange, Green is about groups and communities. Yellow is a systemic compass for certain objectives, et cetera, et cetera. These are all different language. In terms of cultural change, there are three levels to keep in mind. The first is the system doesn't work. You force the change. It's level one change. So you force it until you are there. It might keep as you like. Second is you import elements of a culture. You might import lean, you might import circularity in your business, and it takes some time. You, can, you might import design in an organization. It takes time and effort, and it's quite costly. What I'm interested in sharing with you is level three. The level of three is about setting the condition of change. So you make it so that a community can change by itself. So you don't design, you don't force the change, you don't import elements that encourage certain change. You just design the culture, essentially. So when you map design within this, uh, there are very different uh, levels of uh, influence we could have. So if I start from the blue, universal design, more normative design, 
Um, green is about uh, performance, user experience, um, and emp user empowerment, like you can see in the digital technology, it's all about personal empowerment. Green comes into ethics, core design, social design, etc. And then from the yellow, you change where you not don't design stuff, but you design the rules for something to eventually emerge. And that's what I'm interested in. This is what we call this meta design. Meta design is defined as the extent, it's, it's like system thinking where all stakeholders are not just users, they are co-designers. So you design for the system to operate where everyone in, involved is, a stake, is involved really. So um, that implies covering questions of purpose, ethics, impact, uh, design, generative design principles, and also governance uh, to get the system work. Now, what does that mean in the case of the Anthropocene? For me, it's about shaping, imagine that you're shaping the dynamics of a living systems so that you encourage a certain emergence, especially the SEVA one for taking care of life. So in, case, in my case, this is my driver, right? So I want to translate possible future into preferable present, and I'm shaping system dynamics. I'm empowering people. I'm helping them to be autonomous, having mutuality, share responsibility, and orchestrate their action to be regenerative and, and resilient. Practically, the way I do it is I know techniques that help a community to go outside of the constraints of the spiral dynamics and the fears and the limiting beliefs through um, Claire Graves' uh, uh, um, system, um, sorry, um, success factor modeling on the left. So that model has a duality between something that is unconditional, the left column, vision, purpose, identity, value, talent, contribution, space, and the translation into a world with constraints, ambition, mission, role, belief, capacity, uh, behaviors, and environment. There's a dialogue between the left and the right. The right is under the control of people's ego, and the left is not. So when you get a community of activists or uh, within a company to focus on what, is, what does that mean to define unconditional goals and find what is negotiable to be implemented, you have then a constructive dialogue and how you create that dynamics. This model also brings a hierarchy. You start from vision, ambition. And it is so that, for example, when in a group there's a behavior problem, you don't fix the behavior. You don't design behaviors. You realize the behavior problem is a problem of capacity and the problem of capacity is a problem of beliefs. So to design better behaviors, you need to redesign, to encourage a, a, a change in, in belief. So practically, these are the tools I'm using. So collective intelligence genome from MIT. So how do you define the governance rules for the group? How do you design the culture? Uh, what are the priorities in the level you use? And then on the right, it's a very detailed system where there are uh, energy, matter, natural ecosystem, species, culture, uh, economy, health, and happiness. There's a dynamic balance between resilience, harmony, and autonomy. And there are system functions, for example, for harmony. How do you balance the power? How do you encourage expression? How do you, how do you enable information access? How do you encourage inclusion, equity? So you work on this function that connect the system dynamics and the core elements. It's often that we make huge mistakes when you, we as designer focus on the bottom only. Typically, I'm making a bamboo toothbrush and I'm sure it's better than a plastic toothbrush. The truth is it's not. And it's the wrong focus. You have to go above and focus on how do you find condition for a system to work better and you reset in context the toothbrush. So practically, I'm designing this for like, this is the example of a healthcare platform where I design these conditions so that every actors on the healthcare platform would be really active in setting ambitious goals to change the health system, be active in it and 
engage the community, be empowered to engage their community to drive change. All the thing I, I've explained is like, it's the architecture behind that translate into, you might say in that case, a sort of a Facebook for health impact. And it's all grounded on these principles that surfaces certain functions. Ultimately, the point is uh, that um, by doing this kind of dynamics, we're at a, an amazing moment where if we design the right culture and the right information structure and flow, we are actually reconnecting the entire economy. Banks are looking for ways to count what matters. Communities and collectives, companies are looking for shared purpose in ecosystem, the right governance to be inclusive and the right protocol to assess what we uh, mean by evidence of impact. Many actors need orchestration to move in a certain direction and we need new form of accounting, not to count just volume, but what matters. And all these work through information systems. Um, so I'm working um, with a, a technology layer that helps make this concrete. And it's a combination of uh, finance, group dynamics, purpose, and counting what matters. And um, this is where I think uh, designer, as designers, we could have a lot of impact. And I, I might finish with uh, this a set of questions I would typically ask when I start a project. The very first question I ask, I try to find out about is, what is the actual culture underlying this project? What are the belief or the limiting belief this community uh, is thinking from? If you don't tackle that, you could put system thinking, you could do any methods. There, There's a high risk, they will fail because they're not integrated to the, or not serving uh, the mindset switch that might be necessary. For example, people talk about circular economy, but when you are in circular economy in doing less bad, people tend to just think a circular economy is connecting the dots. But circular economy means something entirely different when you're in a regenerative business. Circular, circularity is a function in the system with more elements in it. So the way, just even with the same word, circularity, the mindset through which people understand the concept is totally different and could be misleading because some might just see it as just a way to maintain business as usual that slightly improve without changing too much. And others see it as just a function in a broader system change. So the first is really to understand the, the, the culture, the fears and the limiting belief. And and uh, how could you, and then you start uh, uh, analyzing the system from there with, with, with the group, um, the, the stakeholders, uh, the business element that are driving uh, failure. So if the business model is sort of hiding that at the end, it's just a volume. So if your point is to sell more car, uh, but you claim that uh, you're selling car for freedom, it obviously doesn't match because more car on the road doesn't drive freedom. So uh, this constructing purpose linked to business models is, is a good way to reassess what really what you're doing is about. And mapping new values um, help you assess uh, how can you coordinate for certain actions. Um, I'd like to keep time for conversation. So there's only uh, seven minutes left. I could go on and on, but um, I've, went, I've, I've scanned over quite complex things. And I'd like to hear how do you feel about uh, this system change and how as a designer you understand your own limitations and what it means to embrace that change for yourself. Not just thinking design is the best source for change, but design itself does have to be influenced and transform its practice to, to get towards an economics of regeneration as well. So I'd like to hear your beliefs on that or, or what you feel as a, it's tricky to, to, to block change from happening. Thanks so very much for, for listening to me and uh, happy to get into that conversation. Thank you so much, Remy. Um, so 
One question already is, what other examples have you seen that prioritize this culture as a beginning step? Um, I do know um, in different business contexts, like I know banks are, are starting from culture often and, and project I've seen. Uh, I've been involved in the COC in French. It's uh, a collective that is meant to um, lead change um, for CEOs. And we use the U theory. So the U theory is a way to deconstruct your belief, get to a point where you can, you are open to see the world differently. And then you learn from your new view of the world, how you can transform your business. So we, we transform through six times, two days and, and a half, 150 CEOs from the mindset change first, and then leading the mindset change to revisiting and transforming the business model. If that answers the question. Yes. So we have another question from Glenn. How could we how could we use this system to regenerate a village that has lost its community and economic offering? Uh, could you rephrase the question for me, please? So, um, how could we kind of regenerate an economy for a village that might have some like biodiversity loss? might have um, certain, yeah, structural kind of um, losses and is really interested in making sure that they prioritize the things that you've mentioned. Okay, uh, I really encourage you to go and download a, the, the document from Symbiosis in Development that I've presented. They have 400 pages documentation that are really helping um, on that. And they have cases where they transformed communities in Australia, and different parts of the world by using the object level I mentioned, the system functions and the balance between resilience, harmony, and autonomy. And they they, they document certain cases that are context-based. Uh, I think the question is very interesting because there is this debate whether we should change the economy from value chain, to make it simple, like uh, I'm in a fashion business, I'm in a car mobility business, da 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 da, da. We try to rearrange stuff. And another group, uh, a more purist, more extreme, would argue the only way is uh, uh, things linked to space. So a village or a bioregion is actually a very good way of seeing how do you put the thing the other way around and get companies or citizens or government to serve that context rather than um, just serve themselves in a way. So a village, a city, a region is a very good start notion of space and boundaries and the symbiosis in development is a very good method. I have another question from Steph, which mentions that I'm fascinated by what you say about storytelling and narratives being overrated. How might you uh, define culture without just the influence of narratives? Yes, I was hoping for that question because most designers believe um, storytelling is the key. Um, I talk from my personal experience here. Um, I've uh, I've been rigorous in learning beyond trying to find what are the limiting beliefs for myself as a designer. And I, I really discover through Gestalt and Jung that most transformation happens through the body, not through the head. Storytelling is only in the head first, and it brings power to the storyteller, to the audience. It's a one way thing. It's not as interactive as you might think. So you have power and you have to use it wisely. It might be useful, but it works only for a certain audience. On the spiral dynamics, it works for the lower parts, like uh, animist tribes, wa uh, warrior tribes, uh, normative space, or even uh, for the progress. They might, they might accept storytelling as a driver, um, but many others don't take it. And the biggest change is through experience. You can get people to... So in Gestalt, um, when you experience a change, uh, then it's um, sort of um, registered in your body. And once it's registered in your body, it's not in your brain, it's, it's there forever. So the techniques are much more about how do you embody embodiment of change rather than narratives? Because narratives is not lived, it's just uh, listening. 
Thank you so much. That's all we have time for. Uh, we've all learned so much, and that's almost it for day one. If you want to stick with the digital, if you want to stick with the digital stream, we have a final film coming up, taking you into the world of Glastonbury and mushrooms. But not like that, rather a pavilion built by mushrooms at this year's festival by Simon Carroll at Temple Studio. Or pop across to the main main stage for the final key note from Professor Dory Tunstall, Dean of Design at Ontario College of Art and Design, talking about how new new books are colonizing design and how that requires radical collaboration. Thank you. Thanks, Philip.